Jesus, Jesus. I, before I forget, I really would like to thank Pastor Edwin and family for extending their hospitality to us. I also thank all of you for extending your hand of fellowship to me and my family. The teaching and the preaching platform is a very sacred platform. Normally, you would not, uh, you go to another church, normally you will not share with an unknown outsider. It's something sacred. You want to protect it. You want to make sure that what has been, what will be dispensed by the person will be something through the word. So I give thanks for the privilege to God, to Pastor Iwin, to, to do this sharing with you. Okay? I was given the topic on becoming a certain kind of person. So this is the topic. When my wife found out, she said, Are you sure you are not yet there, right? So, um, I have to admit, I'm work in progress, just like all of us. So, anyway, let me begin. When I was a younger man, my first car was a Subaru Impreza. I mean, the company that I worked for happened to give me a car allowance. They expected me to get a car. I know nuts about car. I was very impressed by the Zoo CI. He would tell me, wow, this is a boxer engine. You know Subaru Impreza, they use it for the World Rally car race. So I was so taken in. So I bought the car. And then I would drive the car to work. Then my colleagues find out, Wow, you drive a Subaru in Pesa. When you stop at the traffic light, when the traffic light turns green, are you the first car that goes, goes ahead? I say, no, I'm very gentle. <laughs> then she said, you spoil Subaru image. <laughs> I come from Covenant Evangelical Free Church. I've been there for eight years. I cannot claim to represent uh, the leadership as I come here. I come here more as a personal friend. Although I must let you know uh, nothing to boast about, I happen to know the Lord through the ministry of the navigators. I grew up there. My That's way also I met my wife. They say navigators are never daters. So how do I manage to get into a relationship with her? So if we happen to be put into a so-called work together to sort of uh, take care of a cell group that consists of uh, young graduates, male and female. So she looks after the ladies, I look after the men. But we come together for Bible study. That's how I got to know her deeper and things develop from there. That's my romance story. <laughs> and uh, previous, I was from a previous church. I, I was very active in my previous church. I was invited to the church council. I led the adult ministry. Part of the adult ministry, we have what is called adult Bible fellowship. It happens after the service every Sunday. So, I usually would end up teaching about two out of the four uh, sessions per month. So, that was my background. But when I come to CFC, well, maybe I become a bit warmer. 
So anyway, there's, a, there's another story behind it. So anyway, let me begin. We know that discipleship is about following Christ. The way that Pastor Edwin has put it is three, three things. Learning to be with Him. Learning to do what He says. Becoming more like Him. And the second part is disciple making. is to help others to follow Christ. And Pastor Edwin said is helping others to do the same. From my navigator's background, we even make it so simple. We say it's to know Christ and to make Him known. To know Christ and to make Him known. Of course, the knowing is not simply the, the cognitive knowing. It's the, it's the total experientially knowing. That means when it boils down to Christianity, what boils down to Christianity is the relationship with God. Of course, in, when I come to CFC, they, they have another definition for disciple making. They like to use this key phrase called a certain kind. It's what is a certain kind? Initially, they were, initially I thought maybe it's one kind, one type. But later on I understand a certain kind is the kind that is certain, that is sure, that is confident. So the way that we in CFC they this they define disciple making is all about a certain kind of person. It starts with the person who radically commit to a certain kind of purpose, who through a certain kind of process produce, reproduces a certain kind of product. So what does that mean? Maybe uh, Alicia, if you help me to unfold the, the slide. So basically, what they mean by person, purpose and process and product. Person is, firstly, we need to be master. We need to be, to, to, to know Christ, to know God as the master. As a result of that, the way we carry ourselves, we have a manner, a manner that shows that we are the Christ master person. When we talk about purpose, it relates to the Great Commission. Pastor Edmund Chan always say, mandate before mission, mandate before mission. What he means by that is we must understand why before we do it. So the why boils down to the Great Commission. All authority in heaven on, and on earth has been given to me. Jesus proclaimed divine authority. So when we take on the Great Commission, we are not doing it out of our own strength, but we have the divine authority. Then, after that, we go forth and say, go and make disciples, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything I command you. Okay? So, it's mandate and mission. When we talk about process, again, disciple making is not rocket science. It always begins with one oneself showing another. So you need to model. You need to be an example to another person. Only then you can mentor. It always begins with this fundamental principle. Before we can talk about disciple making, let's get our right, our life right. 
before we lead another person. We cannot be the blind leading another blind. But there is also among also caution. There might be some among us that says, I'm never ready, I'm never perfect, therefore I will not do it. That is also a lie. So I believe whatever God deposit in your heart, you can use that to teach others. Some of you are more qualified to teach to teach faith than me. Among you, I interacted, I hear of stories. I'm not going to mention them because I didn't ask for permission. I mean, you are widowed at a young age. You have a five-year-old and six-year-old child. Forty years, you raise them up. You send them to university and so on. I think applause should be given to you. Just that in, in our real life, accolades and awards are not given to people that surmount adversity. Nobody gave me a medal for surviving my septic shock. Nobody is going to give a medal to this widow for having done a fantastic job of raising children, trusting God to provide for over years. So some of you are more qualified to teach faith. Lastly, when we talk about product, we want to be a mature Christian. We want to achieve maturity. When we achieve maturity, then we hope that we can multiply our lives in somebody else. So that is the cyber making from CEFC. That's how we look at it. Of course, then we zoom in a certain kind of person. What is that? It's a Christ master. And that in grace, glory, growth, sorry, we have a material called grace and glory. So it's very irritable of my tongue easily. So uh, let me say that again. A certain kind of person is Christ master with that in grace, growth, and godliness, and seek to with God's empowering to fulfill God's will, God's way, in God's way, for God's glory. So what does that mean? So let's break it down. There are two parts. We want to be a certain kind of person. We must be Christ mastered. That means when we say we are Christ mastered, our thoughts our action, our speech would be what similar to what the Lord would do, the Lord would say, the Lord would think. Okay, Christ mastered. It's not just looking to, to the Lord as our master, but we want Him to master us. And when, when we are mastered, then we will grow in three dimensions. God would, meaning to say, we will live our life yielded to God. And we will also practice allegiance to God. I mean, one of the first signs of allegiance is baptism. Example, being able to publicly declare my faith. I'm a Christian. This is a day I trust the Lord who change me, who fill me with the Holy Spirit. I want to be God's word. Similarly, there's another aspect. When we say a person is Christ's master, a man chan like to use this phrase, nothing to prove, nothing to hide. 
nothing to lose. We are all broken people. We are here because of the grace of God. So, because of that, we can, we can, we need to be humble. I'm not saying that when you go and apply for jobs, you don't put down all your relevant so-called achievement. But we don't need to go around saying, I'm so and so, I own this business, I employ 5,000 people, or this is what I've done. I have performed no 150 surgery under me successfully kill so many people we don't need to do that we can be, have that restedness in God we know that we are precious in his, in his sight and therefore we carry ourselves with this mentality and then we are gentle Gentle doesn't mean sissy. Gentle means you are under control even despite facing pressures. Somebody annoyed you. Somebody perhaps on your way to this hall. Maybe not on you. And then you don't have to take it to heart. You may say, or oh, somebody says something nasty to you. And you, you don't have to, let's say, uh, respond back. The third aspect is the outward, how we live our lives outward. Meaning, there are two aspects. Holiness and love. Holiness as sin. We live a consecrated life. We want we are in the world, in the world, but we are not of the world. Therefore, we we are not enticed by things in the world. There are certain things we do we separate ourselves from. We don't want to get involved. Not because we are, let's say, uh, elite, but because we know that by following the ways of the world will deter us from following our Lord. And love, love means not only we love our brothers and sisters, love means also we love our enemies we are able to pray for them. It's not easy. So we cannot do that unless we are Christ mastered. So let me move on. So when you are Christ mastered, then you will develop manner, the way you carry yourself. Firstly, grace. You will show yourself to be a gracious person, understanding first that you are a recipient of God's grace. I don't deserve it. I'm safe. But therefore, whatever you do to me, whatever you say to me, I can be gracious. And then, as a result of the grace that we receive, we want to experience growth. So we want to mature. We want to develop our faith muscle. And finally, we say we want to experience godliness in our life. That means we defer everything to godliness to having Christ as the center of our life. That's what it means to be godliness. So I want to relate. Next, I, this is what it means to be Christ's master. But how do we get there? 
So I want to use a narrative from the scripture to start or show you uh, perhaps the journey, the way to get there. What is the first step looks like? I'm going to share with you a very familiar passage. So I would like to make it a little bit interactive. Can I have four volunteers? One, I need a narrator. Secondly, I need somebody to play Father Abraham. Thirdly, I want somebody to be the Isaac. Okay, and lastly, I want maybe perhaps a lady, a lady to be angel or the voice of God. So can I have Father Abraham? No, sorry, narrator first. Who is a good reader among us? Come, please. We are running out of time. As Pastor Ewan said, my teaching is very dense. So quickly, can you do? Yeah, thank you so much. We have narrator. Then what about Father Abraham? Father Abraham, please. Okay, come, come, come. Your name is Benjamin. Raymond Tan, wherever you are. Okay, I need Isaac. Where's Isaac? You are Isaac. Come. You are Isaac. So, what about a lady, a sister, to play the angel of God, or God was? Come. Behind me. Okay, good. No need, no need. No need. You are the angel of God. So, what I like you to do is I want you to read your re relevant part. So, you read your relevant part. The passage is also reproduced in your notes. Do you have it? Uh, I don't think the donkey speaks. <laughs> so I think no need today. So it can begin. Okay, uh, so I'll be the narrator, yeah? Okay. Um, let's start, huh? Okay. So Genesis 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, I? <laughs> I am, so here I am. He said, take your, <laughs> take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him donkey. and his son Isaac. <laughs> and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young man, Abraham said to his young man, That's five. Stay here with the donkey, and I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they both so they went both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father, here I am. <laughs> and he said, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Here I am, huh? Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where this is it is you, it is you, it is you. Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for burnt offering? 
God will provide for himself the lamb for the for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place on which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid, laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar, on the top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your own son, your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram a caught pig, in a thicket by his horns. Where's the ram? And Abraham <laughs> went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering <laughs> instead of his son. <laughs> so, so Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Everlasting? Ever, 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 okay. Not everlasting. Everlasting. So the angel will say, Thanks. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Okay. Thanks for your performance. <laughs> so, let's go on. There's a parallel passage in New Testament. In Re he Hebrews eleven seventy, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered Isaac, and he was he who had received the promises, was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom he was said, through Isaac shall your offering be named. I don't think we have time for this, so I will skip. I believe the surrender is the key to becoming Christ master. Surrender is about being faithful to what God calls us to do for Him. God has specific tasks for each of us for specific individuals based on your spiritual gift, based on circumstances of life. He has placed us in different spheres. The word calling comes from the Hebrew classes. God's calling upon our life comes with a call to surrender. We need to surrender to God's agenda. So becoming precise doing. Surrender is the essential posture for cultivating an inner life that leads to discipleship inside out. I'm using the words of Edmund Chan in his book, Cultivating Your Inner Life. So this is not from me, but I believe it's true. We need to surrender. You say, some people say Christianity is difficult. I agree. Some people say Christianity is easy. 
I also agree. What makes the difference? The difference is being surrendered, surrendering to God. So Christianity, being a disciple of Christ, means that we need to surrender to God. We need to partner with God. There's a part in be, being, there's a part in doing. Both of them need to come together. But we need to do it out of the strength of God, not our own. Coming back to the narrative, I let me go a bit fast for the purpose of time. God commanded uh, Abraham to take his only son Isaac to the to Moriah, land of Moriah, and offer him as a burnt offering. I make some mistake in your notes. Please correct it. The number. Moriah is 72 kilometers from Beersheba, or under three day journey. So it's 72. I put 150. My apologies. So this is very consistent with what in Genesis verse 22 verse 4 we say that on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar the place where he was supposed to sacrifice Isaac and Moriah basically is the prominent hill of Jerusalem upon which Solomon Temple was built. I believe you can find this if I'm not mistaken is in Chronicles. So again let me jump through very fast. I think we understand from Leviticus there are a number of offering. For example sin offering Green offering, fellowship offering. So, burnt offering is one of them. And the Bible makes a very great distinction. One of the reasons I find myself very interested with in the original word of the Bible. Basically, if you know, Old Testament are primarily written in Hebrew, some part in Aramaic, the New Testament in Greek. The reason I become so curious, what is the original meaning? So I go and take, take out. I mean, very interesting, the Hebrew language, 20, consists of 22 consonants. They don't have any vowels. And then the, the Greek got 24 so-called alphabet. So the reason as a Bible uh, learner, I dig into this because I really want to understand correctly what the passage says. The reason I can do that, I'm not, I won't say I'm very linguistic. I invested in a Bible survey. I happen to use a goddess. There are others in the market called Olive Tree or Logos or even some other thing. But if you are very serious about studying the Bible, go and invest in one of these Bible software and learn the original word. Okay, that's what you what I've done. So we know that burnt offering comes from the Hebrew word Ola. Whole idea is to burn the offering, slaughter at the you had the animal, you place your hand as if you are transferring your guilt or your sin. After that, you slaughter animal, and then 
you would so called splash the blood around the altar and then bring the carcass, arrange it on the altar and burn it. So that's a burnt offering. Whole idea is to give, bring a pleasing aroma to God. So that's how it's done. I think when so on, I will not elaborate. I have given you the notes so you know. And how? How I explain it already. So anyway, very quickly, we know that when Abraham received the commandments, his response was, Here I am. After that, he listened. And then the next day, very expeditiously, he would, he would set out on his journey. Unlike some of us, we say, Sure not, God, you really want me to do that? Are you the... Are you the Holy Spirit or are you somebody else? But here we see the example. Here I am. The very next day he responded. So he settled his donkey. He brought Isaac, cut the woods, and then bring along two young men. And they journeyed three days. Of course, in those days, when they journeyed three days, it's not like they take a plane, they take a boat, they literally walk. My imagination, my sanctified imagination is most likely they settle the, the donkey with the wood, the firewood, and then they have to walk to this place. And not only walking, they have to climb to, to reach this place. So we have heard the narrative and you saw the performance what happened and and God so called intervened and stop 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 him and he said now I know now I know that you fear God seeing that you have not withheld your son your only son from me and God provided a rent to be sacrificed instead of Isaac. So I was very amused because in this very verse you will find the find this word called Jehovah Jiro. The Lord will provide. And, I, and it says here on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. I mean Jehovah Jaro. By the way, where are we now? It sounds to me like Jerai was saying very similar to Jehovah Jaro. <laughs> I when I prepared this, obviously I honestly I didn't prepare this to be shared with you. I've been meeting another person on a fortnightly basis. I sort of wanted to encourage the person in his walk. I don't want to claim I'm poor as Timothy. I think we are fellow sojourners. Usually I will prepare a passage and then I will share with him. So this was the passage that I was supposed to share with him. And you know that God was very pleased with the response of Abraham. He affirmed him, You have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you. I will multiply your offspring. Your offspring shall possess the gate of the enemies. And in your offspring, all nations shall be blessed. So, resulting from what? Obedience of one person. That is the obedience of Abraham. Father Abraham is basically, I would say, 
the person who will make the way for us. When the promise given to him, he will have offspring as numerous as the Tsar and as the sand. It's referring to us because we are sons and daughters of Father Abraham. And the promise comes because of Christ. That's how we are related to Father Abraham. I think just to mention, there's a difference between test and temptation. Test usually comes from our God, who basically allow a difficult situation to basically test our hearts, whether we are fully devoted to Him or otherwise. While a temptation is an enticement by the devil or the, by our flesh. So, make a difference. When we talk about this narrative, the Bible never contradicts itself. Here, God actually has wanted to test Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac. But to God, sacrificing your child as a form of worship is an abomination. The, the biggest in the land, in the, in the old days, in the time of the Israelite, they would sacrifice to a God called Molech, that is the God of the Ammonites. They literally burn their children, kill their children in fire. This one I don't want to mention, but I be, let me jump ahead. I believe what God enacted in this account was trying to show us His love. He was as if He was trying to tell us, even to the people of old, the site where He was supposed to sacrifice Isaac Moriah is basically Jerusalem. So Christ was crucified outside the city city wall of the ancient Jerusalem. Secondly, God kept mentioning, I want you to sacrifice your son, your only son. Why, why emphasize your only son? It is pointing to, to Christ. We know that the familiar was John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believed in Him will have eternal life shall not perish and have eternal life is pointing to Him and then why make Him journey three days? Why must it be three days? On the third day reminds us the fact that on the third day Christ rise again. God seemed to be enacting a story. He was trying to tell mankind, I I really love you and I'm to the extent I'm going to let go of my only son to be sacrificed on the cross. Yesterday, I played I play a song in Cantonese called, uh, in Cantonese called Ngoi Bat Bo Lao, Ai Pu Bao Liu. In English, it's called Love Unreserved, meaning to say that God so loves us, something that is so precious to Him, He will not be hope, He will not reserve it for Himself. He will let go for us. That is the extent of God's love. 
for each and every one of us. So our reasonable response to God has to be surrendered. But if you are not convinced, one of my favorite was uh, Psalm is Psalm sixteen. In Psalm sixteen, verse one and two, very interesting to me, because the three personal names of God are mentioned. Firstly, if you look at Psalm sixteen, verse one and two, preserve me, O God. For in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, capital letters, Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. Where are the three personal names? Firstly, God, Elohim. But in this passage, they use the singular version called El, E L, Elohim. When we think of God, Elohim, as a matter of fact, I remember Pastor Eroid from us from Genesis 1. Elohim, we think of a greater God. When we think of our greater God, we want to worship Him. And then the capital Lord is translated from a Hebrew word called Yahweh. As a matter of fact, if you know any Jew, they wouldn't say Yahweh Lord. They would say, because they are afraid their lips are unclean, they would say Yahweh. It's a name that is to be reverent. It's so holy. So I cannot simply just it to the average Jew. I cannot simply say Yahweh Lord. Yeah. And then the the last name here, Lord, Adona. Adona means master. You are my master. So what how do we respond to master? You have to be humble before your master. Similarly, in New Testament, the Greek word is kurios. So is Lord, referring to the Lord Jesus and God. So I believe our reasonable response has to be all of the above and surrender. So I believe surrender is the key to being Christ's master. And it takes a lifelong journey. It's not something you, like sinners player, that you say once and that's all. I remember my first Christian camp, is the, the theme was the Lordship of Christ. I was asked to pray us to proclaim that Christ is Lord. I find it so difficult to surrender initially because I came the previous year when I went to Singapore, I not the ship to tell you, I feel in my exam I have to take my supplementary paper and finally go to second year. So in the second year I came to accept the Lord. And here I am as a young Christian. You tell me, accept me as Lord, surrender everything, your studies, everything, surrender. And I'm very fearful. But I look at my seniors, truly some of their examples are very encouraging. They surrender to God. They come back, they do ministry on the campus. They are very faithful in their Bible study. So what I learned from my seniors, is an example. Even if it's the Sunday before the major exam, they will still go to church 
they say to me, I need to honor God and God will honor me. So I learned from them. But it was a struggle. So I struggle with tears to say that you are my Lord. So then again, having, having grown up, grown through the years, I know that saying Lord once is never enough. We need to constantly remind us as men, we battle with the three G's. What I mean by that? The three G's. Girls, go, glory. You can see sex, money, position, power, whatever. Similarly, I would say the ladies struggle with three C's. First C is cash. Second C is conversation. You are, you like to gossip. And then the, the third one is collection. Not only physical things. You may collect intangible things. You still remember five years ago, somebody kicked your leg accidentally. So, the, we struggle with all this. So we are human. We need to continue to come to your before the Lord regularly to say that you are Lord and to humble ourselves that you are Lord, I want to surrender again. We are called to be living sacrifice. The problem with living sacrifice is when sometimes the heat is lighted, we run away. We need to go back to the Lord and say, I surrender. It's a lifelong, not a single event. We need to cultivate a strong inner life. We need to water the garden of our spiritual life. The word prayer. Okay, you need to find encouragement from the word praying with one another. Before your service start, you can don't need to engage in, uh, let's say, frivolous conversation. Come together, just pray, pray for the day, pray for God to bring in the people, pray for your pastor, pray for the preachers. You need to be dependent on the Holy Spirit. That, that is the source of power. Of course, the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. Sometimes He gives us a thought. Sometimes He might give us a dream. Sometimes He may give a word through our brother or sister. We need to establish a disciple-making community. I... I heard that you have some structure, maybe cell group. If you are a cell group leader, one of the things that I will do as a cell group leader is beside calling for my cell group meeting, I will also spend time with some of my core team members, bringing one, two people alongside, and then either interacting deep deeper with them. What has God been saying to you? What have you or how have you been experiencing Him? And then you share. We be honest, we be authentic. And then wherever God place you, you be a faithful witness. Not necessary then you need to verbalize. Firstly, even in a circular place, do your job well. Do your job faithfully. Don't let your boss, your subordinate, your peers find reason to fight you as a Christian. Carry the cross. Be the ambassador for Christ. So, 
This is my suggestion. In covenant EFC, they like to use a term called PDA. PDA stands for personal revival. That means my life has to be vibrant in the Lord. I have to experience personal revival all the time. And then, and then, divine appointment, meaning to say that believe that God may bring it to our path a person that may that whom we may have a word for, or likewise, finally active obedience, meaning to say whatever the Holy Spirit prompts you to do, you do it. So that is disciple making. I do think it's complicated, and you should not need to do it like you carve out a special time. We go for meals. You can use some of your meal times to spend time with the people you invest with. You exercise. You bring along the people you invite. Or maybe you you pray. You can invite people alongside to pray with you. Make it part of life, regular life. You don't have to say, wait until I, my church has the enough classroom. We don't need that. You practice life. When you send your daughter or your son to school, that is a discipleship. Disciple making moment. Share your life, your struggle. Daddy feel with this. Daddy was angry with mommy, which shouldn't be the case. Okay. I I would like to invite the musician to come come to prepare themselves. I I don't know. Since disciple making is not complicated, coming to God is also not complicated. I was told you only need to remember three phrases. The first phrase is thank you. The second is sorry. And the last one is peace. So I like to pray for two groups of people. The first group, I don't want to presume that all of us have a personal relationship with Christ. You may have you may get coming to church, but you have not entrusted your life to God. Or you may be a Christian for a while, but you find yourself backsliding. God is so distant now. But now I want to come back to him. This is your opportunity. I like you to respond to God. When a message or teaching about Lordship is preached or teach, I think we do a disservice to God if we do, if we don't respond to Him as Lord. So I want to pray the first prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. You have not withhold this precious Son from your Son from us. You love us. Sorry that we have not lived the life that you have caused. I've sinned against you. Please come into my life. I invite you to come into my life as Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. For the second group, like you may have been a Christian for many years, as I say, Lord Chip. It's not something you do. You want to proclaim just once. But you want to do it 
continuously and various part of your life. Worship sounds seem to be very simple nowadays. In the olden days, they have to bring an animal. Even David say, in the later stage of David's life, he did something that upset God. God gave him three choices. Will you endure three years of famine, three months on the run from your foes, or three days of pestilence? He chose the last one. But after that, God still, although 70,000 people died, God still relented. He, the angel of God appeared on this threshing floor that belongs to Arona the Jebusite. It was the same site Moriah. And David said, I come to you. I want to buy the land. But Arona said to him, You are the king. You ask for the land, I will willingly give to you. But what was David's reply? David's reply was, I will not offer anything to you, to the Lord, that cost me nothing. So, my encouragement to you, build your altar, a various journey of your life. In this camp, high up in the mountains, build an altar that you can recall this of God's faithfulness, God's love for you. So to the second group of people, I will pray this. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us. Truly, He has endured so much to allow me a taste of eternity. I'm sorry that I have not lived the life worthy of you. I have been enticed by the world and the worldly system. Please receive me again as your son, as your daughter. Remind me that you are Lord. And as I surrender to you, as frightening as it seems, I know that you can make my life better and more meaningful because my life is in you. In Jesus' name I pray, Amen. i like us to respond to this song Do we, are you okay to use this? You have the lyric. Okay, then you use yours. I ask Raymond to lead us. Would you stand, please? Thank you. 